What's going on, everybody? It is How To Tuesday today, and we are going to go over something that we just did on the new episodes of Saltwater Experience. We were fishing for tarpon, and this is a great time of the year to fish for tarpon. Uh, anytime in the spring is a great time. You can fish for tarpon in the Florida Keys any day of the year. Um, the thing about it is that most people that are traveling to the Keys don't experience tarpon fishing on any particular day of the year because you got to hit the weather right. And that's kind of where the locals, the people that live there, you know, you get an extended period of, of nice weather in February, say, you can have a lot of tarpon around and you can take advantage of that and you can catch them. Uh, it can happen pretty much any day of the year, but there is a time of year um, that people refer to as tarpon season. Now, over the years, uh, the tarpon season has kind of slid a little bit earlier, call it global warming, call it changes in their behavior, call it whatever you want. Um, the tarpon are showing up a little bit earlier. The best fishing is happening a little bit earlier and it's, and it's finishing a little bit earlier. So when I first started guiding, it was May and June, May and June were the best times of the year. If you ask somebody what time, what, what time of the year was tarpon season, it would be May and June, April, certainly lots of tarpon are caught in April. Uh, but when the fish are migrating and they're coming in, that was known as May and June. I would say now it's April and May, and uh, it's not that June is not a good month. You can still catch plenty of tarpon in June. You can catch plenty of tarpon in July. But where the mass of migrating fish are going to be is is really in the months of April, May, and June. Let's say that for uh, I think that's fair to say. Uh, it, some years it's happening a little bit earlier. Some years it's happening a little bit later. It is just like a bird migration and that these fish aren't there, um, before and this big push of fish comes through and then they don't seem to be there after there are resident fish that hang around all year long. There are, um, small migrations that push in when the mullet push in, when the ballyhoo push in. But for the most part, there is a migratory bunch of fish that comes through in April, May, and June. And that's what we were just fishing for um, at the bridges. The bridges are an outstanding place to fish for the tarpon. It offers a tremendous amount of food. There's a lot of current coming through there. Probably has something to do with their spawning behavior where they want to be in those type of areas. But I'm not exactly sure why they do this, but they come to the bridges in big numbers. And one bridge in particular is quite close to Hawks Cave, uh, and that is the Long Key Bridge. Now, there are 42 bridges in the Keys. A lot of them have good tarpon fishing. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is a rig that we use at Long Key Bridge. And I'm going to go over the whole rig and exactly how we fish it. And you can, you can use that if it applies to a bridge or a situation near you. Or you can go right to Long Key Bridge and use this exact rig, and it will it will work. This is exactly what we were using, and what what Rich uses, you know, as as tackle has has evolved. But Rich has been fishing there uh, since he was a kid, and there is a method to fishing there, which is using live mullet. Now, if you go down to Bahia Honda Bridge, that's traditionally a crab fishing fishery down there and there are some differences It's much deeper down there there are fish but um they're doing some different things let's talk about long key bridge right now and let's go over the exact rig that we're using and why and so i want to start with the reel we're on the tackle direct website right now and this reel that i like for tarpon fishing is the daiwa uh saltiga spinning reel this is a premium reel from daiwa and it is the size that I like is the 18,000. The 18,000 has a 5.8 to 1 retrieve ratio. So it's not the fastest reel in the, on the market. But what this one has is tremendous line capacity. And I like that very much because what I want to do when we're fishing the bridges for tarpon, I'm going to use a rig that is much, much, much heavier than any rig I use anywhere else for tarpon. Now, the reason why is because the fish will take off and wrap you around the bridge. It will wrap, it will take hard turns and the line will come across the bridge. And if you're using your regular 12, 20 pound line that you're using for tarpon in the backcountry, it's not going to last very long. So with the advent of heavier braid, you can use 
80 pound braid, 60 pound braid. And believe me, it's not going to stay 80 or 60 for very long. If you hook a couple of fish, that line is going to go through the bridge. It's going to get worn down and you're going to be fishing with much, much less. Um, there's another reason that I want to fish with heavy line at the bridge is because there are a lot of sharks at the bridge. There are big hammerheads that live there. And if you play a fish too long, it will get eaten by a hammerhead. It, it will happen. So you want to fish with tackle heavy enough that you can put maximum pressure on these fish. You can hook them, land them, release them very, very quickly. Okay. And if it is starting to take too long, you should break them off. Even if it's your first one. So this is the reel that I like the 18,000 Daiwa Saltiga spinning reel. Now this is an expensive reel. It is definitely a top end reel from Daiwa. I'm not saying that this is the only one that will catch a tarpon. There are lots of reels from Daiwa that will catch a tarpon, but what you're looking for is high line capacity. So you can use this heavier line and you want, you know, this one in particular has a 55 pound drag, which nobody can use that. I mean, you would have to be tied into the boat to have a 55 pound drag. I don't know if you, if you've ever tried that, but a fish would literally pull you off your feet. It would be like having the, the thing locked down at 55 pounds. So don't suggest that you use that much, but you could. It has a tremendous drag. Now, here's what I'm interested in. It has uh, braid capacity. 50 pound, you can put 280 yards uh, on, on this reel, on the 18,000 reel. So you can even go up a little more. And um, maybe you're down to 250 yards of 80, and that's going to be enough uh, for sure and because you're going to chase the fish with the boat, but you're going to need heavy line, and you're going to need to um, have enough for that initial run. So that's the reel that I'm choosing, and that's the reason why. The rod that I like, I want a heavy rod to go with this. If, if you're going to be using heavy line and heavy drag and, and uh, you're going to intend to put a lot of pressure on a fish, you have to have a rod that can also do that. So the one that I have picked over the last couple of years is this St. Croix Legend Tournament uh, inshore spinning rod and a very particular model. This is a rod that I love for big tarpon at the bridge, and I also like it for really big sharks. And that is the eight foot. It's the only rod I use. Oh, well, maybe there's a couple other rods that I use in eight feet, but I don't use eight foot rods very often. This one is particularly good. It is an eight foot heavy. It's their heaviest rod in this, in this, uh, in this um, model, in the Legend Tournament inshore. And I like the eight foot because you can really throw a mullet up towards the bridge, a heavy mullet. You can also put the rods in the Bernoulli rod holders that we're using. And it's almost like using outriggers because the mullet want to swim together. They want to cross and you're all the time moving one rod to the other. I find a longer rod helps to keep the mullet from crossing. I find this longer rod also is excellent for getting around the bow when the fish is going underneath the boat, around the engine for when the fish is, uh, is, is crossing behind the boat. And it throws a mullet really, really well. So this one is my choice. And not to mention the most important part, you can put some serious wood to these fish. You can really, really, really fight them fast. And again, you want to fight them fast so that you avoid the hammerheads. You don't want these fish to get eaten by hammerheads. You want to play them out as fast as you possibly can and, you know, get, get your jumps out of them, whatever you need to do. And uh, if it's taking too long and they're starting to drag you away from the bridge, break them off. I mean, because they will, they will get eaten. These fish are, these hammerheads are there. They're there for a reason and they are there to eat tarpon. And if you play your t fish too long, like I said before, it will get eaten. Okay. So that's the real, the Saltiga match to the St. Croix legend tournament inshore. And I'm going to use Daiwa J braid, um, 80 pound, 80 or 65. Either one is something that, that I like a lot. I, I prefer dark green. I was using yellow um, recently. I don't think that the fish are really seeing it. Um, you just want heavy line that you can cast, 
that's not going to fill up your spool. So you want that heavy line to be thin. That's what Daiwa um, is is really good at is making um, very thin braid that is very very strong. So I like the Daiwa J braid. I'll get it in in dark green if possible. Um, and all of this stuff is available at Tackle Direct. We'll have the links right in the uh, show notes. So you can, if you need any of these things, you can go right there and they'll take care, take really good care of you. So that's the line I use. Now with, uh, with, with this, I want to be able to cast easily and I want the, a really strong knot between the line and the fluorocarbon. Now when you're using 60 pound fluorocarbon, like we're going to use here, the, the, the J fluoro by Daiwa at 60 pound and 80 pound, I don't even need a Bimini twist. Now, bimini twist, if you're not familiar with, with saltwater knots, a bimini twist is a way that you can double the line over so that you can tie a knot with two strands of line, which is twice as strong as tying it with one strand of line without losing any um, strength in the main line. And the bimini twist is very thin. It goes through the guides very easily. And a lot of times when we're using light line, we'll tie a bimini twist so that then we can tie another knot with the two strands, which makes it even stronger. In all of this fishing, I'm just tying a double uni knot. I'm tying a uni knot to from the braid to the fluoro and uh, another uni knot from the fluoro to the braid. And then pulling those together, they jam together to form a very strong knot where the tag ends are parallel to the main lines as opposed to perpendicular to the main lines. That's where you're going to have a real big problem uh, getting the, the knots to go in and out of the guides very easily at all. The double uni knot goes in and out of the guides very easily. It's very, very strong. So that's that's what I use there. I'm going to use 60 pound. Um, if I felt like I could get the bite with 80 pound, I'd use that. But I do think that they become a little bit leader shy there. And um, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, a float. Now, you're not using a float to hold your mullet up. You're using a float so that you can see where you are in relation to the bridge because you're going to pay out your line. Your mullet is going to get nervous. When a mullet gets nervous, it starts swimming all over the place. You don't want to get hung on the bridge. So a float allows everybody in the boat, regardless of their fishing ability, to get the bait into the magic area. And the magic area is going to be kind of associated with the shadow line of the bridge. And you'll see that in midday, there'll be a, be, the sun will be up, there'll be a shadow. And if you can get back into that shadow or maybe just ahead of the shadow, but a lot of times the fish are going to be hanging right in that shadow line. That shadow line is close to the new bridge and it's also fairly close to the old bridge. So if you just let your line out, you'll, you'll pay your mullet out way too far. You'll get it wrapped around the bridge and it's not fun to, to get that out. You have to pull your anchor, you have to do all kinds of things. So we found that a kite float or a removable float that is chartreuse, it's orange, it's something that you can see well up the line uh, will help everybody to know where the mullet is. The, the captain can just look back there and see that the lines are right in the right spot. You can see if you got weeds on it, you can see everything becomes much easier with the float. So I like the float for that reason. You can do it without if you're if you're if you're fishing it yourself and you know exactly where your mullet is, fine. And you can do it without the float, no problem. If you need a float, which a lot of people feel like they do, these these floats that you use on kite fishing or other ones that are removable are very good. But you just want it to be something that you can see and know where your bait is at all times. So when we're putting on the the double uni knot for the uh, fluorocarbon leader, I'm going to take one full pull, both arms, so about six feet, and then another half a pull at least. So I'll have about a nine foot uh, leader. And this uh, float will go up the line um, as far as I can go and still be able to cast the mullet. All right, so it's probably up there about six feet with this eight foot rod. You're going to be able to cast it very well with a six foot overhang, and uh, and that'll be great. So now the one thing that we're missing is the hook, and the hook that I like is the Gamakatsu 
straight eye inline circle. This is this is a really good one by Gamakatsu. It's an octopus circle hook. It is very. It's just like it says. It's a very very sharp circle hook. Um, I much prefer the circle hook to the J hook for this type of fishing. And we're just going to go in the mullet in his upper lip. Don't pin his mouth shut. They don't last as long like that, but just stick the hook inside the mouth and come out the top of the, uh, top of, of, of the nose of the mullet. You don't want to go too far in there. You'll brain him and they won't last very long. And it's super critical that your mullet are active. They're jumping around, they're moving. The more active they are, the bigger signal that they're putting out, the further away you can bring a fish in. If they're just dancing right over the top of a fish that is reluctant to bite, a uh, really active mullet tends to get the bite much faster than a, than a, a dead or dying mullet. Uh, they just, they're not as excited about those. They want one that's going to get away, just like a big old cat, uh, you know, you're, you, you can play with a cat and the more you pull it away, the more they want it, right? Same thing with a tarpon. Once they get uh, to where they want to bite it, they will go up. Oftentimes the mullet will jump out of the water. The tarpon will actually miss the bait and end up getting angry about that. Or and that's what it seems like. And man, they crash it and crash it and crash it until they get it. And um, that is, uh, that's, that's, that's really what, bridge tarpon fishing is all about the bite on uh, a tarpon biting a live mullet is one of the best bites in all of sport fishing and if you haven't seen it i suggest that that you do it's something to experience it really is i really like that very much so let's talk about a couple of other things when you do get the bite in my opinion the rod holder in your boat does a phenomenal job of hooking the fish because the fish is jump, because the mullet wants to jump around when a tarpon is after it, uh, oftentimes people will start reeling and pu- start pulling the fish out of the strike zone and uh, not get it. Or they will, I don't know, do whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll let it back or they'll do whatever. In the rod holder, if the rod is in the rod holder and that fish bites that mullet, and I usually have a, a pretty light drag, Man, that fish takes it down. That circle hook comes right into the edge of the ma- mouth, and you can pick up that rod, and you've got the fish on. Okay, I like the rod holder. I like letting the rod holder uh, set the hook. It's a great way to do it. If you prefer to do it with your hands, that's fine too. Um, but what you want to do is just reel down tight to that fish, let that circle hook find its spot, then you're on. So now there's one more thing to talk about, and that is your anchor setup at the bridge. This is absolutely crucial. If you hook a fish and you run to the front of the boat and you expect to be able to pull your anchor up in time, you're never going to do it. You have to have a breakaway, well, not breakaway, but a uh, float on your anchor ball or on your anchor line so that you can throw it and leave it. Okay. So you want an amount of line that is manageable. It's only about eight or 10 feet deep. Uh, at a lot of these bridges, so you want maybe maybe forty or fifty feet of anchor line at the most. You don't want a two hundred foot anchor line. You want just just enough to anchor in any condition. So if if it's rougher, obviously you need more uh, anchor line. If it's calm, you need less anchor line. Uh, if the current's really screaming, you probably need more. If it's really calm, you might not need as much. So you find an, a, a length of anchor line for your particular boat. You have a buoy attached to the line and if you fish the bridge often enough maybe you have loops in your anchor line or you just tie it off to the cleat to where you can do it other guides will have um they will have a uh, a swift release cleat where it'll be back by the console so as soon as you get a bite you just rip that out of the the swift release cleat it goes up and 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 you're you're gone it's it takes one second and uh Otherwise, you need to run up to the front, throw that anchor, throw the ball. You'll come back and get all that stuff later. Um, Then you have to get on the throttle. Okay. So this part of the fight takes a lot of teamwork. And it also takes some communication between the captain and everybody that's on in the boat. When you're doing a lot of this bridge fishing, a lot of times you have people that maybe have never done anything like this. So 
when you do get a bite and somebody says fish on, the captain throws the line and the um, this should all be taken care of in advance. You need to tell your passengers, you need to tell your anglers, you need to tell everybody that's going to be there, listen, this is what's going to happen if we hook a fish. That fish is going to want to take us and wrap us all around that bridge, so I'm going to have to act really fast. We want to keep this lane open so that I can get to the front of the boat and I can get back here without having to trip over anybody or asking anybody to move. So if you're going to sit someplace, sit in a place where you're not in this in this path. Then... Once we do that, I'm coming back to the anchor or, or coming back to the throttle. I'm going to throw it in reverse. The angler is going to move to the bow and we're going to spin the boat and start after that fish. So at this point, you want to tell everybody in the boat to sit down and hold on. The angler's moving to the front. Everybody else is sitting down and holding on because this can get like a rodeo and you don't want to throw anybody out of the boat during this time. It, it would be a bad, bad, bad thing to throw somebody out of the boat. It would be very, very dangerous. So everybody that is not fighting the fish, sit down and hold on. Don't get up. Take pictures and everything else. After we get through the bridge, let's get through this one part and then there'll be lots of time for pictures. There'll be lots of time for video. There'll be lots of time for everything else or just sit there and, and take the pictures and take the video because you, you do not want to be in a place where you could lose your balance. Um, and you, sometimes the captain has to drive a boat pretty aggressively around the bridge to, to not hit the bridge, to follow that tarpon. And, uh, it's just not a place you want to go in at all under any circumstances. So when you have a fish on, you're going to communicate to the captain. Uh, eventually, that fish is going to go through the bridge. It's super critical that you know which span the, that he went through. You're communicating with the captain or the boat driver that he knows which span they go through. Then you go through that same span. It's not uncommon for a fish to go return back through the bridge. And on this last trip, we had one go back through, back and forth through the bridge eight times. So once you get through the bridge, the fight's not over. And typically, the fish is going to get eaten by a hammerhead past the outside power poles, way out there a little bit for whatever reason. That's where those hammerheads want to hang out. And uh, if you start to get out there, you need to really question how important this fish is to you and, uh, and break it off if you need to. And, and, you know, after you've had some chafing on the leader, all you got to do is point at that fish and uh, hold the reel and it's just going to break right off. And that is way better for the fish. So I, I strongly encourage that. So anyway, that is how to Tuesday for today. And that is how to fish at the Long Key Bridge, the exact rig that we use. You can find all the links in the notes below. And uh, you can go to our friends at Tackle Direct and they will take really, really good care of you. Make sure that you get exactly the tackle that you want. If you have any problems, call them. They're awesome. They are. Their customer service is as good as anyone out there and in my opinion better and uh that's where i do my shopping that's strongly recommended that that uh you give them a try too so if you need this tackle that's a great place to get it if you have any questions you can always uh text you we have the text number you could text tarpon to i always forget this number so i'm going to cheat and i'm going to look at it right now you can always text me at 305-930-7346. That is the number where you can always reach me. If you text Tarpon to that, I'll know exactly what you're what you're asking about. That's cool. Or just just hit me up right there and uh you can and I'll I'll get back to you on the text thread. That's the best way of getting in touch with me. And um I hope this was helpful. Uh, for those that are looking for the tarpon information. And uh, man, I hope you get out there and catch one of these fish. They are amazing fish. I strongly recommend it. And uh, for many, it's a life dream to to catch one of these. And I see why. Man, they jump out of the water. They do backflips. They, they crash mullet. They're just a cool fish. So I wish you the best of luck if you're going for them this season. I hope this information will help. If you need more information, don't hesitate to text. All right. Thanks. We'll see you next week on How To Tuesday. 